let's do blockchain, but in JSON. And let's also have encryption, not just integrity. Hello, I'm Phil Han Baker, and in this presentation, I want to complete the presentations of the three core technologies on which the mathematical mesh is built. So I've shown you meta cryptography. I've shown you UDF fingerprints, otherwise known as Ruby on Rails for crypto. And I've shown you data at rest envelope. In this presentation, I want to show how we can stack envelopes together to form a chain or a Merkle tree. And of course, last podcast was mostly preparatory for this one in that the main reason that we needed to redo PKCS7 was so that, was not that, you know, ASN1 is all that bad, but because we need to be able to change it quite radically in order to make envelopes work fluently as sequences. Okay, so what is a dare say sequence? It's an append only stack of envelopes. So we start off here with an envelope. We add it to our sequence. We add another one to the sequence and so on. The, le the envelopes can be a varying length. They can be long, they can be small. However, and this is a difference between DARE sequence and DARE envelopes, the exact size of the envelope, of the addition to the sequence, has to be known at the time that we write the frame out. And the reason for that is that we want to be able to scan efficiently through the sequence, either in the forwards direction or the back direction. And um, so each frame is wrapped with a little bit of binary data that has a pointer from the first frame, gives the length. So it starts off with a length pointer, telling us how long the frame is. And Oh, let's do that in. So it starts off with a length indicator at the front, telling us how long that uh, frame is. It also has a length indicator at the back, so that what we can do is that we can start at the start of the um, sequence and move forward. So frame zero, one, bounce to two, bounce to three, and so on. Or we can start right at the end, which is, you know, an easily obtained place. We can read out the length here and we can efficiently backtrack. So this gives us order n uh, navigation in the backwards or the forwards direction through the sequence where n is the number of pieces in the sequence. And that's really useful because when we uh, first open a, fr uh, a, con uh, a sequence, what we do is that we read the first frame and the last frame, and that gives us all the context that we need to add additional items into the sequence. We can synchronize to that sequence almost immediately uh, without having to go over through, through a lot of overhead. Now, sometimes, of course, order n isn't enough. And so what we want to have is order log 2 of n. And we can do that by building an index tree as we go along. So what we do is we build this binary tree. And each... Um, each entry that we add has a pointer to the immediately enclosing uh, tree apex. So uh, if we add a pointer here, that will point to there because that's immediately enclosing. And then we add one here and it will point to, it's same again, but this point we point to, 
So basically we, we're building up this tree and that allows us to navigate to frame number X in log 2N operations, no matter where we are. And it's just a binary tree search, which is, you know, convenient. Now, sometimes, of course, what you want to be able to do is to open up the sequence and then go to exactly the frame that you want in order of one complexity. And we can also do that if we write out an index and put that at the end of the um, sequence. So quite often in a dare sequence, the very last uh, frame envelope in the sequence will be an index of the whole thing. And then we've got order one lookup and can just go straight to whatever it is that we need. So that's our navigation capabilities that we get in dare sequence. We've got sequential navigation, chain, forwards or backwards direction. We've got a binary tree and we've got a direct index. Okay. Oh, and the other thing that we can do with the index is if we write out an index and then we keep appending afterwards, well, we could scrub off this index and then write the data there and then put the index back at the end, which is essentially how zip files work. Or alternatively, what we could do is to use delta indexes, indices. And if we append a bit to this se sequence, just leave it unindexed for, you know, two, three, 20 odd containers so that we get to log 20, you know, order 20 complexity, uh, which isn't too bad. And then once the index gets too big, write out a complete index or alternatively, just write out a delta. You know, so you've got, we've added 64 items to this sequence. Okay, we'll have an index for just those 64 items. And then that will point to the previous complete index. So there's various strategies that can be achieved using the tools that Dare Sequence provides, which is best in which or, uh, circumstance. You know, that's the sort of thing that uh, graduate student projects are made out of. OK, so that's the basic navigation capabilities. But, you know, obviously the mesh is a cryptographic infrastructure. So we want to be able to put digests and integrity checks and signatures. So since each of these is a DARE envelope, we can, of course, just stick a signature onto any of these frames, and that's fine. Uh, or we could put a digest on, and the digest can be useful in of it on of itself, simply because that digest value can then provide us with a super checksum over the contents. Now, whenever we're doing this integrity checking, we're always doing it over the envelope payload, which will be ciphertext if the envelope is encrypted. This means that we can always validate the integrity of a sequence, even though we cannot decrypt it. And that's critical in the mesh. I'll show you why uh, a bit later on. So we can sign them, so we can gen generate a, um, a chain of, um, we can generate a chain of digest by calculating the digest here. And then when we calculate this digest, we add in the previous one and this one and so on. So we can, uh, you know, do your standard blockchain thing. However, that's not really very efficient for the, for the types of uses, uses we've got in mind for DARE sequence. And I just mentioned that we've got this uh, binary chain uh, capability. Well, surely we also want to be able to, um, we, we also want to be able to do a Merkle tree type integrity test. And that's actually exactly what we then do. So we can build up a Merkle tree and 
So we've got a continuous um, integrity check over the values of the tree. Pretty efficient and um, you know, not too difficult or complicated to calculate. It does mean that when we start up, when we start open a, a sequence to append, we've now got uh, a log two of n startup cost because we've got to find uh, our position in the tree and calculate the digest and so on. So there is a bit of an overhead there, but not too much. It's worst case log two. Okay, so we've got an integrity checking mechanism, which is, you know, same as we've got in blockchain or in certificate transparency. And this integrity checking is used within the mesh to check the integrity of sequences that are being copied from one place to another. So we always check the Merkle tree outputs before and after to make sure that we're adding the entries in the right place to the right container and that we've not got a right contention issue going on. Okay, so we've got the integrity uh, checking. How about encryption? You know, wouldn't incremental encryption be nice as well? And that is exactly what the mesh provides us with. We've got, we can encrypt incrementally. So this Merkle tree capability, we sign the apex of our tree. So we sign the last element in our sequence and we've got an integrity check of any of those um, envelopes in the sequence. We can check that envelope for the cost of one public key ver validation verification. So we sign and verify one public key operation for the whole container, no matter how long. So we can have a million items in this container with one signature. Really powerful if you can try to create something like a file zip archive type thing, or do content uh, software distribution types applications. Contrawise, though, it would be nice to be able to put a key exchange at the start here and be able to apply this key exchange that we've done in the first record, apply that key exchange to encrypt all the further bodies. And that is exactly why we have that key exchange mechanism, the KDF mechanism in their envelope because that's what allows us to perform one key exchange and apply it to a whole different sequence of envelopes. The only thing that we change for each envelope is that each envelope must have a unique nonce. And it doesn't matter how long it is, so long as each one of these nonces is unique, that will ensure that we've got a different key, a different encryption key, initialization, vection, everything for each of the envelopes and data sequences and everything. So different nonce per packet. Now the other trick that we can do with this incremental encryption is that we can um, erase a container payload by erasing the nonce. And to do that, what we need to be able to do is that we need to be able to, we need to generate a nonce that is sufficiently long. So if the nonce is 128 bits and it is unguessable, the work factor of guessing that um, not key is 2 to 128, then the work factor for decrypting the envelope will be 2 to 128 if we erase the key. And this can be really, really useful in um, GDRP, uh, GDPR type context, HIPAA, whatever, or if you're doing an online forum, whatever. And so you've got this date, this envelope in the middle of your sequence, and you suddenly discover that you absolutely have to delete the payload there. and put it beyond your visibility 
because you know maybe there's child abuse in it you know maybe somebody send you a gdpr um takedown notice or whatever maybe it's copyright content so traditionally what you would need to do is to overwrite this whole block with the zeros which is really bad when you've got chain digest whatever there are protections you know the dare format is designed so that we can go around that and still check the integrity of the sequence even though if the payload's gone but if you've got, if this is say two gigabytes of data, you're probably not going to be wanting to wait to delete the whole thing if it's that important. So what we can do with a DARE envelope is that if we overwrite the nonce value alone, so we've got a header and there is a nonce in there and the nonce is the input to the KDF that's used to encrypt the payload if we take away the nonce value we can't decrypt so just overwriting 16 bytes or 24 bytes or you know 64 bytes of data in the head renders the whole of the contents inaccessible and doesn't interfere with the integrity checking over the rest of the uh, sequence which is which is um, really powerful okay so we've got a append only log that has integrity and confidentiality controls that can both be applied incrementally how could we apply this well one way that we can apply this is to create a log file format that is gdpr compliant or hiphop compliant whatever so the basic idea here is each time the server starts up it does a key exchange and creates a new key under which it will encrypt the entries into the log. And what this means is that we can be encrypting the data as it is written to the log without having to write everything to disk and then encrypt, which is obviously putting our data at risk. Uh, we can always pull the last hundred records off the log because of that. You know, we can traverse the chain in both ways. It's going to be efficient because there's only one uh, key exchange to undo per you know per server session or per hour or whatever. We don't have to do a public key operation to decrypt each individual entry. And those entries could be more substantial than we have in traditional logs. And I'll get into that in a moment when we start to talk about catalogs and persistence. And we have that ability to redact individual entries by overwriting the salt and increasing the work factor to decrypt that to 2 to the power 128 because we've missed, we, we deleted a critical piece of information. In all it takes to delete a piece of information from our log file now is to delete the nonce. We don't have to uh, delete the data itself. So that's powerful. Another thing that we might use it for is to create a web file archive, a zip archive type thing. And I've got a separate presentation on this because there's a WPAC working group that has been started. And while it looks like they're focused on reusing zip, if you choose to go and develop something new, well, I've already done a lot of that work uh, of producing something that is JSON friendly and has crypto built in and integrity checking and Merkle trees and is actually designed to be used as a software distribution format and a web data distribution format. And I'll explain a bit more about that in the WPAX piece. So we can create a web file archive, one operation to encrypt, one operation to decrypt, you know, the whole thing. We can pull out individual envelopes efficiently without having to perform a separate decryption for each envelope. Uh, we can sign the whole sequence as one and only need to verify that signature once. Some real advantages there. And we've got a format that we can use for forensic data collection. Now, this is very, really powerful because 
if you've got a tamper evident format we should have been using this for all police logs or police communications that are entered into evidence because you automatically get chain of custody so you know all photographic evidence taken at the scene of a crime should be entered into a tamper evident forensic log and the same for if it's a computer related crime you know every device that is taken down and is uh, cloned we should get a fingerprint of the drive or the device or whatever at the moment it is analyzed the first time and not have this situation where we have cases that deter that turn on whether the person who did the forensics did it right because quite often that first person if they've messed up you've got no way of going back and of course all court submissions again they should all be entered into a tamper evident log it's just common sense okay so the way that we use the dare sequence in the mesh which is what it was designed for of course is two things one is mesh spools and the second is mesh catalogs a mesh spool is used to um it's a spool of mesh messages usually we could also use them as a spool of tasks but so the idea here is that alice talking to bob when she sends this message, her message to her outbound service, it's going to be recorded on something, and that's going to be an outbound spool, okay? And then when it is passed over to Bob, that's going to be added to Bob's inbound spool. And these inbound and outbound spools are their sequences that can be synchronized to each one of Alice's or Bob's devices and so they've got a quick and easy way of obtaining all the state of the date messages that they've sent and received across all of their devices built into the protocol and the only thing that we need is a mechanism to synchronize their sequences I'll come to how we do that in a moment and so it's also designed so that we can periodically purge the spool and delete the entries uh, that are unnecessary using mark sweep or whatever types which and you know this is starting to look like a log based file system which is not surprisingly okay so the other one that we have here is a mesh catalog a catalog is like a spool except that a spool is a list of messages a catalog is a sequence of device uh, of objects and each object has an identifier and so each entry has a unique identifier that is either the fingerprint of a profile or whatever it uniquely identifies what it is whether that be a device or a credential that we stored or uh, a contact whose data that we've stored or whatever we have a unique uh, identifier and each one of those objects has a very simple life cycle of add update delete and that's it so this is a very very simple acid persistence store so it's giving us the atomicity criteria but we're not getting the relational database model that we'd expect from a sequel or any rich semantics we expect from your likes of mongodb or whatever this is a really simple persistence model sufficient to keep the stores of Alice's devices her passwords her contacts and so on and those are all stored as a dare sequence that can be synchronized to each of her devices and so what we end up with is a sequence here a system here where all the the dare sequence is the fundamental representation of all the data that is being stored in a mesh service and so the only things that the mesh service protocol needs to do in order to synchronize a device to the service is to have one mechanism to synchronize a dare sequence 
to the device. And that will provide us with all the capabilities we need for synchronizing passwords, devices, uh, task entries, calendars, everything. We get it all from one simple primitive, which is basically, here are two sequences. The service always has the authoritative copy of the sequence. So the service one may be a bit longer. So this is the service. And this is the device. The device starts up and it says, oh, I'm, I've only got six items here. Uh, and it gets the status from the, mesh, from the mesh service. And the mesh service says, well, actually, there are eight items in this sequence. You need two more envelopes. And the other thing that it does is it provides the mesh... So it provides the Merkle tree digest output. So whenever we do a synchronization result, we always provide the mesh sequence output of the uh, that we expect at the end of the sequence. And we do that for download and for upload. And what this means is that we always ensure that the, the integrity of the containers in that what happens is that first of all this um, the device synchronizes by pulling the status and asking for these two extra envelopes so it's downloaded them and it checks to see okay yes I've got the same mesh output value my output digest value is the same one that the service had that's good and then if it's got wants to make some uh, uh, changes to upload some changes, uh, you know, it's added a password or, or whatever. It then will send the proposed update to the service and it will say if your final digest output is this, then here is the next block to put in. And what this means is that we prevent race conditions if two um, devices try to update the same catalog or spool simultaneously and so we get protection there and so that's their container it's a very lightweight uh, format that provides us with blockchain like incremental integrity checks and also complementary incremental encryption and so that completes my description of the three core technologies of the mesh. In the next presentation, I will explain the mesh archive, the DARE archive format, uh, because of the WPAC work. Uh, and then af immediately after that, I will dive deeper into how the mesh service works uh, and explain that. So again, please click like. Please subscribe. We've got to secure the web. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you.